wonderful worship time with wonderful hymns full of precious gospel truth. We're going to be looking this morning to Isaiah chapter 53, the first seven verses. Spend most of our time in the first two or three verses. The beauty and the saving power of Jesus Christ. We could call this chapter the, fifth, the forbidden chapter. If we were in a synagogue this morning and they were reading this portion, they would typically read a portion of the Torah, first five books of the Bible. And then they'd read a portion of the half Torah, which is selections from the various prophets. Uh, this began as a custom during the time of uh, Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes, you remember him? Number four, uh, he persecuted the Jews horrendously and forbade the reading of the Torah. And so they started reading portions of the prophets and they call it the half Torah. But when they get to Isaiah 52 and read chapter 52, they skip to 54. Now you can go out on Jewish websites and they'll say, oh, that's a bunch of propaganda, of anti-Semitism and all this kind of stuff. But I kept reading and uh, I didn't want to give any fake news. And I found a, a website, uh, a Jewish website where the, the rabbi said, Chapter 53 will never be read in a Jewish synagogue worship service. Those half Torah portions were chosen because they relate to some uh, festival or some prophecy uh, that's found in the fir first five books and it's obvious why 53 should be left out because there is nothing there. Now that's sort of a paraphrase, but that's, that's the essence of what he said. Well, before we get overly amazed or look down at them, remember that today they are under judgment, blinded. And in fact, before you were born again by the Spirit of God, you were dead in sin and blind. And if you see today, if you can rejoice in the truth, of Isaiah 53. Amen. If today you come for the first time to personally rejoice in the truth of Isaiah 53, it is not your intellect. It is divine revelation. Be grateful. Be grateful. These verses, I'll read the first three again, this time from the ESV. I'm not sure good words that you shared and I thought it was ESV I'm not sure it doesn't matter it's all the word who has believed what he has heard from us let me start over who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground he hath no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him Excuse me. He is despised and rejected by men, man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Father, we ask for the ministry of the Spirit of God upon the Word of God, that we would hear the Word of the Lord today, and we give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 53 verse 1 begins with a very important question. Who will believe? Who will believe? Who will receive revelation today? Let me turn it this way. Have you believed? Do you believe? Isaiah 55 verse 1 says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, 
Come ye to the waters. He that has no money, come ye, eat, yea, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. And so, picturesque language to call people in need to come. In Acts chapter 8, verse 28 through 38, there's a familiar story of a dark-skinned African from Ethiopia who's traveling from Jerusalem back home. He's in a chariot, and he's reading from Isaiah 53. And God brings Philip along and says, do you know what you're reading? He said, well, I don't have anybody to teach me. I, I don't understand what I'm reading. And most of you will know that Philip started at that same place and preached unto him Jesus. Hallelujah. The Old Testament was closed. He could not understand. Again, don't be surprised when you share the gospel with someone and they don't understand. We've been spending some time in Romans in uh, recent months, and one of the things we saw in chapter 3, in verse 10 and 11, there is none righteous, no, not one, and there is none that understand it. Uh, when you get to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 14, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, neither indeed can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And yet it pleases God that by the power of the gospel, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, and it pleases God by the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. You may be reading a, a, a written sermon, you may be listening to a spoken sermon in a setting like this or on your radio or however or in a Sunday school class and the gospel is being given. It pleases God by this foolishness to save those that believe. And so the eunuch believed. And he said, well, what hinders me from being baptized? And he said, if you believe, you may. And so he was baptized and went on his, his way rejoicing. Don't underestimate the fact of what he had just heard. He had just heard Isaiah 53 expounded to him, where in Isaiah 53 we learn that the Messiah would go to the cross and pay the sin debt for sinners. And so there's Holy Spirit conviction upon this man and he wants to be baptized to give expression to death, burial, and resurrection. Death to his old life. His sins buried in the blood of Christ, raised to new life. Have you ever come to a, a point in your life? Can you go back? You may not know the calendar date. I don't. But there was a point in my life when by the grace of God, I became convinced, convicted that I was a sinner. And when the gospel became personal to me, and when, by the grace of God, I repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. The conviction came while letting a Methodist preacher through the barnyard gate to, for he and his wife to go fishing. And he stopped the car and began to ask me about my soul. I put him off. I was 11 or 12 years old. Acted all together. But when he left and went on his way to go fishing, I had for the first time in my life something I had never, I have no remembrance of experiencing before, and that was conviction that I was a sinner and that I was lost. God only saves lost people. He doesn't save the righteous. The first thing he does is convinces you and convicts you that you're under the wrath of God and that you need a Savior. Can you, by the grace of God, say that there came a day when I saw the beauty of Jesus? A lot of people see no beauty in him. And so you, you came to him with all your sin. You cried out, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now another question is, you maybe sit here, and many of you, you're, you're like Philip. You already know Jesus. 
you've already, you're living in the experience of Isaiah 53. And so the question is, are you ready and available to open your Bible and preach Jesus? And you say, but I'm not a pastor. He wasn't. I'm not an apostle. None of us are. I'm not a deacon. He wasn't. He was assigned as one of those to help keep the Greek and Hebrew widows happy. <laughs> Pretty nice assignment. We're just going to leave that there, but that's, that was his assignment. <laughs> well, here's how God works. When we fulfill the assignments that God has already given us, in his time, he opens another door. So many times through the years, I've known the people who are unhappy with where they are because there's an assignment, there's a ministry, there's something they want to do, and there's no open door for it. I have a number of pastors on my Facebook list, and from time to time, the retired pastors will get on there and lament that they have no pulpit. And nobody's inviting them to come preach. And I'm thinking, well, don't you, aren't you a member of a local church? Philip didn't have a congregation. He said one. He preached to one. Is there not one in your world to whom you can give the gospel? What do you mean you don't have a pulpit? You don't have to be behind something like this. Philip is a wonderful model for us. Be faithful where we are. And by the way, the qualifications to help those widows was to be honest report, of honest report, filled with the Holy Spirit, and full of wisdom. Being faithful where you are, and God will open the next door. But back in Isaiah 53, the chapter is full of revelation about Jesus. Who believes? Again, men don't naturally believe. If you do believe, it is div divine revelation. When the word of God is preached, it pleases God by the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So may this be a day in which Jesus becomes precious to you if he's not already. Jesus said on another occasion, as stated in John 7, Come and drink. Come and drink from the fountain of living water. Uh, he calls out. John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. It's on the feast day. The last day of the great feast, Jesus stood up and cried, saying, If any man thirst... Let him come to me and drink. Are you thirsty? Are you trying to get your thirst filled in the world? Or have you found that to be empty and the Spirit of God is opening your mind and heart to the beauty of Jesus Christ? That you are a sinner and he's the only one who stepped forward to pay your sin debt. Jesus has always been, but when he became a man, he began in a virgin's womb, a babe in Mary's lap. He grew up in a carpenter's home. And as you look here in Isaiah 53, it says he grew up as a tender plant springing up from a dead stump. Jesus was born in the time when the house of David that had been glorious was downtrodden. Israel is in bad shape. Under the thumb of Rome. Glory days long since past. The whole nation lying in the ruins of sin's consequences. The whole nation dry ground. Degraded enslaved nothing there to nourish the life to which 
God had called Jesus. Put your, put your mind around that for a moment. If you want to say born on the wrong side of the track, just put whatever place and setting you want to, and there's nothing there to nourish the life to which God had called Jesus. Oh, but did you catch it? There was an oasis. Did you see it? In verse 2, and he shall grow up before him. Yes, a root out of dry ground, a place that is not conducive to a spiritual life. And many times, you know, we say, well, you know, I would live the Christian life and I'd be strong in the Lord. But you just don't understand what I have to live around. You don't understand all the limitations of, and the stuff I have to put up with. And, and on and on and on we go. Jesus tasted all of that. But in the midst of that, he grew up before him. And when you take all of the biblical revelation that we have, we know that what that means is that Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, lived in unbroken fellowship with his Father. None of his circumstances of life could hinder him from living in unbroken fellowship with his Father. Let's get off of our excuses. Jesus had a passion to only do and only say what his father told him to do and what his father told him to say. He lived an unbroken fellowship. He had an undivided will. He lived to please his father. A root out of dry ground. Yes, the, drown, the ground is dry. The difficult circumstances are there from the culture in which I'm raised. But I'm living before him. We live in the midst of a world system of pleasures and possessions and positions and popularity and, and we seek those and that none of them can nourish your soul. There's so many things and situations, if I could have this and if I could have this and I could, if I could go there and if I could drive this and, and if I had this position, if I had, oh, things would be so wonderful and, and, and if I had this and this, it'd be easy to live the Christian life and on we go. If I look this way, my nose wasn't so long, my ears weren't so big. We have a whole long list of things that are hindrances in our mind to serving the Lord. And so we live in a world where there's plenty for our decaying flesh and nothing for our soul. But there is an oasis. Following the steps of Jesus... Jesus grew up before his father with an undivided will, with a passion to fellowship with his father, a passion to please his father. Cast all your care upon him. Follow in the steps of Jesus. Set the Lord before you. Cultivate a yielded heart. And you will thrive spiritually. In verse 2, you're asked to consider this incredible thought, is there no beauty in Jesus? He hath no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. I don't know if you've ever seen it or not, but I've got something in my email files, a, a person took all the characteristics of a typical Jew and, and put a composite together and put a picture out there. If, of course, the Bible prohibits pictures of Jesus, but if, if, if he looked like a typical Jew, he would look like this. And nothing like all the pictures that are on walls and in Sunday school literature and all like that. And I'll be honest with you, when I, when I saw it, I thought it looked like a, a young Saddam Hussein. Wasn't very attractive. Well, we were, this is the closest thing we have to a physical description of Jesus Christ. He was not a tall, handsome, 
physique kind of person that you just head and shoulders of everybody else and oh he must be wonderful he's good looking or whatever there's no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him there is no beauty that we should desire him and yet if you're a Christian you have found him to be the most beautiful person who ever walked on the face of the earth And maybe you've known some human individuals who, as you looked at their physical physique, there was no beauty there, but you, you were around them long enough to see something of their character and something of their demeanor and something of their spirit, and they radiated the love of Christ, and you said, oh, what a beautiful person. I remember the first time this ever happened to me. I was in junior college. Can't call this girl's name now, but I can see her face. She was not a pretty sight. Had the worst set of buck teeth you ever seen in your life. She was about, she could see well enough to get around, that's it. She was basically blind. She radiated Jesus. Everybody loved this girl. We're drawn to her because of her spirit. The spirit of Christ in and through her. She was a beautiful person. But today, churches are trying to make Jesus attractive because he's not attractive to the, to the world. Trying to dress him up. The world doesn't like preaching, doesn't like doctrine, doesn't like biblical terminology. So give me music, drama, theater, sports, comedy, entertainment, positive thinking, holidays, something flashy. Don't mention judgment, don't mention wrath, don't mention hell. This, this path is so popular, uh, the head over the billion member cult, the largest cult in the world, Catholicism has decreed there's no hell. There are evangelicals who are saying there's no hell. Well, what does Jesus say? Don't cry out, you killed Jesus, repent, believe. I'm a little bit suspicious of people who get all excited about, supposedly, about the resurrection, but they are very quick to pass by the crucifixion and to take into consideration why he was crucified. He came to pay a debt we did not owe. I mean, he, he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. And unless I am willing to come to grips with crucifixion and why he came and why he was crucified, I have no basis to rejoice in his resurrection. But oh, when I see by the grace of God that this one is so beautiful and that my sin was laid upon him and he willingly took it and he says in verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our um, peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray and turned to our own way, and the Lord, the Lord God Almighty, the Heavenly Father, hath laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. Oh, blessed Holy Spirit, show us the beauty of Jesus today. Show us the man of sorrows, the suffering Savior, so that we, like the eunuch, can rejoice. Israel found no beauty in Jesus. They would have welcomed a soldier on a great horse, gird your sword, come and destroy the Roman oppressor. There was an initial excitement about Jesus. He's got power. He can walk on water. He can feed 5,000. He can heal the sick. But we've got a problem here, Keith. He's not lining up with our politics. And the more he spoke, the, more, the less they liked him. 
And when he started saying things like, Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the, the peacemakers, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, love your enemies, I did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give my life a ransom for many. They laughed. There was beauty there, but they didn't see it. The masses had no admiration or welcome for one who came meek and lowly, offering his sin, offering his body a, a, and his soul an offering for sin. You know why? Because they were not troubled with their sin. They already had a solution to sin. We have this works system. We have this religious system. And we have a system for our sin. We don't want a solution for sin. We want someone to take Rome off our back. It's not personal sin today that troubles the average person. It's the stock market. Or your health. Or your job. Or fun. Or whether or not I'm pretty enough to be liked or handsome enough to be liked and on you go the masses love sin excuse sin deny sin so how can a savior from sin be delightful I need to look in the mirror do I love Jesus do I see his beauty? Uh, do I see him as a hindrance to my plans, to my sin, to what I want to do? And so I'm going to go join one of these churches, and they're popping up everywhere, and the biggest one in America won't even mention sin. Not in his vocabulary. God didn't call him to use that word. Do you see his beauty? Are you troubled over your sin? Or is it, I'm more concerned about getting the boyfriend or the girlfriend I want, or being popular, or getting this job. I'll never see the beauty of Jesus Christ. I'll never be attracted to Jesus Christ until I'm troubled over my sin, and I have no solution to my sin, and I know that I'm under the wrath of God, and only the mercy of God keeps me out of hell one second longer. Then I'll see the beauty of Jesus. May God open our eyes to the beauty of the suffering servant Jesus who saves from sin. Verse 3 speaks about how he was despised. Think about it. There's no person in all of history who on the one hand by the grace of God is more loved for 2,000 years, people have laid down their lives willingly for his namesake. And others hate him. Away with this man. Give us Barabbas. Crucify him. That's not just a sound that comes outside these walls, but inside the walls of churches today. Sure, we want Jesus to take us to heaven when we die. But when Jesus exposes our sin and our self-will and he opposes and prohibits or says no to some of our plan, our desires, it's easier than you think to despise him. When it says in verse 3 he was rejected of men, the context is really he was rejected of men of high rank. And we know that the chief priest and the rulers rejected the Lord of glory. Nevertheless, John 1.12 says, He came into his own, and they received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. In verse 3, in gross unbelief, men hide their faces from Jesus. Will you hide from Jesus today? Hide behind some excuse. 
He stands ready to save. He stands ready to forgive, to heal. Will you shrink back? Or will you cry out, O oh Lord God, be merciful to me, a sinner? Again, verse 3 is so rich, so deep. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. How can that be? He was anointed with the oil of gladness above all others. In his personal being, never was a man more content. He was perfectly content, full of joy. No one ever lived a more joyful life than Jesus, and yet he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The prophet Jeremiah said, Oh, is there any sorrow like his sorrow? When you gaze upon Jesus, you see holiness and love and purity and faith and goodness and mercy and joy. But the most striking look upon Jesus is to see him, the man of sorrows. And we're going to sing that in a little bit. 175. All men have burdens. His was the heaviest of all. His sinless back was burdened with our sins. I think one of the most astounding, riveting scenes in all of the Bible might well be on that occasion as recorded in, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, when Jesus stands and looks out over Jerusalem. And he beheld the city. And the King James simply says he wept over it. Those who study languages tell us that it was loud weeping. He burst into loud weeping and said, If you had known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they're hid from your eyes. The Bible is very plain about the sovereignty of God and salvation. The Bible is also very plain about the responsibility of a sinner. And Jesus says, He wept. If you had only known. Are you here today on the verge of committing spiritual suicide. God has spoken to you. God has revealed himself to you. He's shown you the beauty of Jesus. He's shown you the Savior. He's shown you your sin. And you turn away. Jesus, who is the living spring of joy, was a man of sorrows. Why? Because he took upon himself the sinner's debt and carried it as his own. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Amen. And when he paid that sin debt, he said, it is finished. And the Father said, Amen. Three days later, he's raised from the dead. And because I live, you live. And when you encounter Jesus Christ savingly, you begin to have the testimony of the Apostle Paul. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross, by which I'm crucified unto the world, and the world is crucified unto me. I've been reading some people who are trying to pit and trying to figure out which is the most important doctrine in the Bible, and some are saying the resurrection is. The resurrection is very important. But if Jesus does not make propitiation for sins, there's no resurrection. And I'm not going to get into that battle, but I'm only going to say that the Spirit of God led the Apostle Paul not to say, God forbid that I should glory save in the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, he went into great detail telling us the necessity of the resurrection, the glories of the resurrection. But the passion of his life was this, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. It's not either or, but there is a sequence. And so therefore I glory, God forbid that I glory, saving the cross. 
God is calling us as Christian people here this morning to glory in the beauty and the wonder of Jesus Christ. Go home and read Isaiah 53 again. I'll be honest with you, I'm not there. I've never been there. I heard Mr. Joe Carroll tell about a man that I believe it was someone he knew personally who gave humble testimony that he never could complete reading Isaiah 53 without coming to tears before he had finished. Tears of amazement and joy at the wonder that God would so love him and pay such a price. May that be our heart. If you never come to physical tears, may this passage grip your soul again and again. I'll be one of those passages that you go to again and again to get your compass right for what you face tomorrow. What a beautiful, wonderful Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. Father, have your own way in our hearts and lives. Help us to see the awesomeness and the, the, the difficulty of our position as sinners. Help us as believers never to forget who we were and never to forget now in Christ who we are. May this be a day in which we thrill afresh and anew in awe and wonder at the death, burial, and resurrection, ascension, and soon return of our Lord and Savior. May we go forth to be available and ready students to be Philip to some soul this coming week, even before the day is out. And Father, we pray that there would be those even sitting here who because you are speaking to their hearts, they find themselves digging into the word of God, wanting to know the Savior from sin. Reveal the beauty and the wonder of Jesus to sinners today. And we give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing and obey the Lord as we sing.